Oh yeah, that that that's why we have override on. It's because it's the same button that I use to turn my software on. My recording software. Derp. Okay. Um. Hmm. New map mode, states and territories. So this is uh let, let's just see which which land you have. Um, states and territories. Our new feature that uh, we need to talk about, we're gonna talk about down here. Added a historical neutral tag, which makes countries less likely to become friends or enemies. Okay, so I'm picturing Sweden, or sorry, Switzerland, probably. Colonists in a trade company provinces no no longer change the religion or culture of the province. So, if you're colonizing and you add it to a trade company, then it will stay the religion and culture of that that area. So I'm assuming, still, I haven't tested this because I haven't played as a colonizer yet, that if you don't add it to a trade company and you just colonize it, wait till the colony's done, and then add it to a trade company, it'll still be your religion and your culture. I, I don't know. I That's what it makes sense to me. Admirals now have siege ability, which increases blockade efficiency by 10% per point. Oh, paradox, man, I swear. When the game first came out, admirals had siege value. They didn't, it didn't do anything, so they eventually removed it. And... For ages and ages and ages, other people, including myself, were saying, why don't you just make it so that sieges, siege pips on admirals affects blockade efficiency? But they didn't do that, and now they've added it back in. What? Just, okay, it's nice, it's good. Okay, so I'm assuming what this means by blockade efficiency, it's not going to make your blockade stronger, it's going to give you more sail speed. So if you have uh, 10 ships and they have a sail speed of 30, now each, uh, each blockade point is going to give you, or each siege pip is going to give you an extra 10% sail speed, so they'll be stronger in applying their blockades. So you'll need fewer ships to apply the blockade, is my expectation. Merchant Marine now gives plus 50% sailors, and Press Gangs now give plus 20% sailor recovery. Okay, that's fine. Added mechanics for sailors given from development and ports. You get 25 sailors per one development of any type. So... So it doesn't matter if it's a coastal province, any type of development gives you 25 sailors and they recover over time just like manpower. And uh, yeah, I haven't so far run into a situation where I've run out of manpower or sailor power rather. You do, if, you're, if your ships take damage, then if they, you know, if a ship loses half of its hull strength, then it loses half of its sailors. And when it recovers, when you repair it, you need sailors to, to repair the ship as well. My only real complaint with this mechanic is that if you use the mothball feature, you're killing sailors. They don't get returned to your sailor cap. They don't get returned to your sailor pool. If they just die, you're murdering them. You, you, you take those heavy ships that each hold 200 sailors, mothball them down to 25% strength, and you've just executed 150 sailors. What? Okay, so that's how that works. Interesting, right? Added a continue button to end game screen to allow you to go beyond the supported end date if not playing Iron Man. What? I hate this, right? So if you're playing Iron Man, the game still ends. If you're not playing Iron Man, you can keep going. What? How about at the end of the game, it stops being Iron Man? Like, what? Anyway. The degree to which a trade node is monopolized as determined by the greatest power share now adds a 100% to the privateer power modifier. Also known as, also known as if you're a player and you 100% a node because the AI doesn't do that, then enemy nations will have basically double the normal amount of trade power they would have from their privateers. So it's just a nerf to players. Makes it harder for players to have 100% control of a node. Province tool tips now show more information regarding blockaded fleet, blockading fleets. Yep, okay. Blockades are now indicated on the map with special border graphics. This is really nice. It looks very good. It's a lot easier to see than those silly little fishnets that they put around the ports in the past. Implemented a new system called States and Territories, where states give most benefits of being non-overseas, while territories have autonomy and is considered to be overseas for many rules. Okay, so there's going to be a lot of people who are on both sides of the fence on this one. Some people are going to say that it's horrible. Some people are going to say that it's really good. Um, some people are going to say it's historic. Other people are going to say, I don't care. I want my world conquest. That kind of thing. And I like it. I think it's actually better than it used to be. Because it used to be that if you're Portugal and you conquer Northern Africa, it's distant overseas. Even though it's right next door, it's distant overseas because it's in a different continent. Now, you get to control what's distant overseas and what's not distant overseas. So that's really good. Now, when it comes to world conquest, the thing to pay attention to is that uh, territories cost 50% multiplicative. So it, that's the same as it used to be. If you if you were the Ottomans and you created a little land bridge, like you, you blocked yourself off from Asia and then you were coring distant overseas territory in Africa or in, in Asia, you would only pay half as much because it was distant overseas. That's still the same. So you pay 50% to, to core a territory and then only if you want to make it into a state, 
do you pay the extra 50% to make it a full core, which is instantaneous, by the way. So, why does this make World Conquest easier, in my opinion? Well, the reason is that you can control your admin point spending and just have less land become full price coring cost. It used to be that, okay, you're the Ottomans, you're conquering Asia, you had to make this decision, like, when do I stop taking advantage of the cheap coring cost in order to get the power from all this land? Now, that is something that we do lose with this change. There is no more of the pay half price and then suddenly somehow get a full core by connecting the land bridge. You can't do that anymore. But you still can core stuff and continue to core at half price as long as you want. Meaning that World Conquest is going to cost, I think, fewer overall admin points, which is going to make it easier to do. Because um, when you get to the point where you're strong enough to conquer the world, you don't really need more power. You don't need more autonomy reduction. You don't need more land or manpower or money. You don't need any of that stuff. You just need to have the admin points to core everything. And so, I don't know. I, I like the change. I think it's neat. It's interesting. It's good. Added corruption, which is impacted by being unbalanced in tech, having overextension and lack of religious unity. It can be combated by investment in the budget, corrupt imp corruption impact, minimum autonomy in a country. Impact. Minimum autonomy in a country. It's ability to espionage and all power costs. It also increases your PowerPoint cap. So if you have, um, let's say you have 10% corruption, then 999 point cap equals 999 times 1.1. So you'll raise your, your, your cap on, on points as well. I, that confused me at first because I kept going over a thousand points occasionally and I was like, what in the heck is going on? I'm a Western nation, it's Holland. Why am I going over the points? So that's what that does. Now in these patch notes, it doesn't say anything about corruption being affected by high mercantilism. So it could just be that in the review build that I played, that tooltip hadn't been updated. I don't know. Someone needs to go test it. I'm going to go play with the, the patch, of course, as soon as I'm done with these notes. And uh, we'll see. Added corrupt cheat to set the level of corruption. Admirals now get siege pips to help with blockade efficiency. Thanks, Paradox, for letting us know about it twice. That's really nice. Um, and added a decision to go to form Rome. Now what this does, you need to be Catholic or a pagan religion like animist or... Um, I don't remember if there's another type of pagan... Uh, like, I, th I think it's just animist. Animist, Catholic, uh, Protestant, you know, like any kind of form, any form of Catholicism, then you can form the Roman nation. In order to do it, the decision, you have to, you have to actually control Rome, and then you have to have a ton and ton, just a ton of land controlled. And then you can form the Roman Empire. That's nice. Game balance. Shipyards and grand shipyards now decrease build time and increase force limits instead of reducing ship costs. So there is no more modifier available that reduces build ship costs. Uh, building ship costs, which also means you can't reduce the cost of upgrading your ships. I actually find this to be a very, very good change for two reasons. Number one is that I hated having to find the provinces that had the shipyards so that I could pay 10% less for my ships. And I also didn't like how they added this really cool feature where you could add new ships to your existing fleets, but you it would just pick whatever province was closest by with the shortest build time. It didn't care at all about whether you're getting the discount or not. So the, the two ideas were conflicting. It's like, do I do it manually or do I let the AI do it so that I can have, you know, ease of use? Now that there's no more ship cost reduction, it just doesn't matter. The AI will do it right for you, which makes it easier. Docks and dry docks now increase sailors by 50% and 100% instead of increasing force limits. Now, you might be thinking, okay, well, docks used to increase force limits. Don't worry. So now basically it's shipyards, which used to be god awful, now are amazing. Each shipyard increases force limit by two, the grand shipyard increases force limit by four, and they also decrease build time. Or sorry, yeah. Yeah, they decrease build time by 50%. Uh, 25% and 50% I think it is. Or maybe it's just 50% on both, I can't recall. Anyway, um, so shipyards are just great. You want them in every single coastal province, always. And then docks, I think, are completely worthless. <laughs> They're so stupid now. Because all they do is you give you more sailors, and I've never run into an issue where I have too many sailors. So, I don't know, we'll see. Maybe if you have enough shipyards, you'll need docks. It's possible. I do need to update my smarter AI mod now because I made it so the AI stopped building shipyards. Now they need to build shipyards. So, capitals can now be moved to any province that's inside a state. So, if you create a state in a distant overseas place, then you can move your capital. As far as I've, as far as I've seen, I believe you can use this to move your capital freely to any other continent now. I don't think you have to worry about being isolated, right? It says you can move it to any province that's inside a state. So if you're Portugal and you add something in America to uh, make it a state, 
feasibly you should be able to move your capital to the to the new world. Seems like it. That's the case to me. I don't know. It is now possible for primitives to reform government religion if they have a total of 18 tech levels between admin, dip, and mill, even if they do not border Western country. Reforming in this way will not give any free tech boost, though. It is now possible to choose whether to use your or your subject's claim when threatening war. Cool. OPMs that are free cities or trade league members now less likely to buy provinces. Makes sense, because they'd lose... They would lose their free city status. <clears throat> or they would be kicked out of the trade league. <coughs> Pardon me. Too much talking, not enough water. Vassals and marches of merchant republics now transfer 50% of their trade power to the merchant republic overlord. Transfer trade power no longer costs a relationship slot. That's a rate, really, really good change. Considering things like guarantee, um, well, not guarantee, but threaten uh, a warning doesn't cost relationship slot. I don't think trade power should cost a relationship slot. I still think that forced military access shouldn't cost a relationship slot either, personally, but... Removed overseas impact on aggressive expansion. Okay. I think the way that that reads, that's actually going to increase aggressive expansion generation. Because it used to be that if you were Portugal attacking like India, that um, because you were getting distant overseas aggressive expansion, it would like reduce it. I don't know. I could be wrong. Something, some aggressive expansion got changed, basically. It is no longer possible to make vassals embargo nations that they haven't discovered. Makes sense. Reverted the region-based discovery mechanics from 1.15 to province-based as before. Nothing like treading backwards, right? <clears throat> Merchant republics that grow over a size of 20 owned provinces now suffer scaling penalty th to their republican tradition. Subject-owned provinces do not count towards this limit. So the idea is to keep merchant republics small, right? They're not supposed to be large, sprawling empires. They're supposed to be... Like Venice, right? They're supposed to be naval-based and small province count, high trade power, that kind of thing. <clears throat> Aristocrats and merchant republics now increase sailors by 25% instead of plus 10% land force limits. Halved the size of merchant republic production bonus. Oh, that's sad. Merchant republics now always give their production bonus to provinces where they have trade power, even if they or someone transferring trade power on to them own the province, but not if the province is gold. Lack of debate in Parliament is no longer a hit on legitimacy or Republican tradition, but an increase in corruption. Okay, that's fine. So it costs money now instead of the far, far more valuable legitimacy in Republican tradition. Each seat now has a 25% chance of backing an issue. Ignore corruption bribe now increases corruption. <laughs> okay. Administrative idea finisher now increases your states from, by plus 3 instead of plus 10% goods produced. I always felt that this was pretty weak anyway. So you start off with the base of five states that you're allowed to have, which is about 15 provinces, roughly. And depending on your government rank, you'll usually have anywhere from 10 to 15 at the start of the game with most countries. As your administrative techno technology level goes up, you gain more states by automatically, and the administrator administrative idea finisher just gives you an extra three. So, I don't know. I think that you'll still see that you can conquer a pretty sizable area and have it be not distant overseas, but overall... I'd say we're probably going to have less land that's not considered distant overseas, which is probably good. You know, if you control all of Europe and all of North America, like all, I mean, one thing to consider, actually, I wonder if getting a million manpower is still going to be feasible now without being able to have all of the land in the whole country or the whole planet um, not considered distant overseas. I don't know. The expansion finisher is now minus 25% state maintenance. Uh, yes, yeah, states cost money, by the way. Military zeal act no longer boosts discipline. Okay. Added the fetishism religion. Rebels with unrest below 0% will now still revolt if they have a supporter. So if you support rebels in another country, which does cost like 80 spy network efficiency or spy network strength, um, they will still be able to rebel. So that's interesting. It's very expensive to do so with some of them. Reduced liberty desire from tariffs. Reduced decreased tariffs cost to a sane level from 100 to 25. Uh, that's fine. The cost increase is still 50. Sub-Saharan tech group renamed to West African. Added Central African tech group. Added East African tech group. Mercenaries can now be built in overseas provinces. That's nice. Countries with very few forts relative to their size and less than 10 forts total now have their unfortified provinces worth more war score when occupied by enemies. This is a nerf to players that only have a fort in their capital. Um, AI is going to get more war score from occupying your non-fort protected land. And forts still cost a lot of money and the AI still gets them for free. I still feel like they need to make the AI better. And the AI needs to stop going into bankruptcy. And they need to stop having free forts. I think it's it's a cop-out. I think it's weak. I'm still disappointed. Ships blockading now give naval tradition. Blockaded percent now compares development times one minus autonomy, not one per port. 
Okay, so we had some multiplicative modifiers that were wrong in previous patches. Call for Peace now resets for allies, not just the war leader when stab hit is refused. Okay. Local autonomy is no longer affecting building times, as this became too much of a stacking effect when unrest was also affecting it. The Trade Conflict CB no longer allows you to take land, revoke cores, or release nations in peace. So you can only take money, humiliate, I believe. You can take prestige, take the concession to defeat. You can take war reps. You can take uh, transfer trade power. Those kinds of things. Victory cards? Blah, who cares? Um, <laughs> sorry, Paradox. No one cares about victory cards, except for you. Maximum power now scales with all power costs as well. Okay, yep, so that's the thing. Yeah, if your power costs are higher for some reason, then you can have more trade power, more maximum admin point cap. Raised provinces now actually increase unrest. That makes sense. Maybe they should have done that last patch. Threaten war acceptance now takes into account the backing of coalitions. The AI will no longer pirate in nodes where any allies are would, would be offended. That's great. AI no longer wants to help allies with the rebels, their rebels, unless trust and manpower are both high. So you can't just abuse an ally uh, as easily. Loyal subjects now use their overlords, rivals, allies, and attitude when determining military access acceptance. Very, very good change. No longer will your idiot little vassals allow your enemy to get to the other people to get to you when they shouldn't. So that's great. There's now a build, a bunch of buildings AI won't build during war, mainly because that would be better spent elsewhere. Notably, like uh, the really big buildings, the many factories. AI will now try to spend a, a huge treasury a bit faster than it used to. AI can now cheat on maintenance for border and capital forts. Oh, great. So now they get to cheat on their capital fort as well. Wonderful. I still I still just feel like they're handling this wrong, okay? Instead of making it so that a mothballed fort has no garrison, just make it so that a mothballed fort has like half garrison. And then make them pay for it, damn it. Then they could turn the fort off and still not get ambushed. Like, that's why they changed it. They changed it for two reasons. Number one... Because players were ambushing forts that had no garrison. And number two, because they're having such issues with their economy. So get rid of the player ambush by having them have like a default garrison size of like 100 people. Doesn't it seem kind of comical that if you're going to mothball a, a fort that you're going to leave no one there? No one. No. To me, it, it, leave a token force. Leave 100 people there that are going to hang out and, you know, make sure that there aren't rats in the cellars or something. Just put 100 troops in there and now it can't be ambushed. And then make the AI better. Make them not go bankrupt. Like, they made a, a really good change down here. And I think that the AI is close to maybe not being bankrupt. We're going to see it a little bit further down. The AI will no longer hire mercenary cav or mercenary cannons. They will only hire mercenary infantry. So that's going to go a long way, I think. Because they'll, they'll stop getting mercs, merc, uh, merc cannons, which cost like 50 ducats to hire, just instantly stack wiped. So that'll be good. <clears throat> Fix the problem with them not hiring advisors. They should no longer demand unlawful territory multiple times. Slightly tweaked how they pick ideas based on the idea group elimination thread. So there was a thread in the forums. <coughs> I need some water, sorry. Oh, it's much better. There was a thread in the forums where players were voting down idea groups and they used this information to help the AI choose idea groups better, which is great. <coughs> Optimize how the AI disables pathfinding through blocking forts might yield significant results late game. This is like one of the most cryptic patch notes that I've ever seen. What the hell does this mean? No one knows. AI now declares war using the coalition CB if there is one. <clears throat> what this means is that if the AI is considering declaring war on you and they have the option to use the coalition CB, then they will always use it over any other CB. They're not going to use a claim CB or a, you know, a return core CB or anything like that. They're going to use the coalition CB. Fixed case of enemies automatically detaching from units that they're attached to, resulting in apparent lack of activity. Fixed another case of the AI not returning their army home. Fixed peace desire modifier to make an AI nation that started an independence war less likely to peace out before achieving the necessary war score. Fixed case of AI splinters not being capable of returning by transport navy when there's no land path. Fixed case of AI ignoring the presence of a unit if in a province if it was, if it was moving out of it. Fixed a serious bug involving AI regiments getting stuck as splinters of exploration armies. Okay, these should be in the bug fix section, I really think. AI now makes some effort to systematically protect the strait that they deem most appropriate in their home area. Uh, one thing that uh, they were talking about doing is putting in a strait crossing between uh, Calais and... Uh, was it Kent, I think? It was, a, it was a strait between England and Europe. And they didn't put that in. It's not in the patch. So... There is one between uh, Ceuta, I think it was Ceuta, and 
um, and Gibraltar. So there's the Gibraltar Strait between uh, southern Western Europe and North Africa, but they did not do the one between uh, England and Europe. The AI no longer cheats with forts uh, border bordering wastelands. I mean, thanks Paradox, it's a bone, I guess, but why not give us you know a competent AI? Longer country names no longer overflow their given namespace. Or, okay, better rounding of monthly advisor costs. Uh, added a province development page to the ledger. That's maybe interesting. I haven't seen this yet. I should go look at that. The ledger page listing provinces now shows correct manpower values. Okay. I skipped some of these because they just don't seem to matter. Straits are now colored red if they can be blocked by the player. Dark gray if they cannot be blocked. Okay. That's like if they if they control both sides of the straight, you can't blockade them. Um, that kind of thing. Um, bum, bum, bum. Outliner mission icon now showing for all different types of, na of naval missions. When you try to sell or grant a province that belongs to an estate, the description will now include the resulting change in loyalty, influence, and territory. Updated interface when making course to show development instead of base tax. Uh, okay. Improved information in estate tooltips. Okay. Okay, these are just, these are bug fixes. Change send and confirm, that kind of thing. Change some setup stuff. So there's a whole bunch of setup changes, right? There's new provinces, there's new new territory in Ireland. Revise the map of Sweden, Hungary, North, Northern Russia. Um, France got a boost to their starting development. And Ireland got a boost to starting development. So there's a number of changes there. There's a whole bunch of new provinces down in Southern Africa. Um, so go check those out. And then these are the most notable bug fixes. You're no longer hindered from building any army template that it, that it, if it consists solely of mercenaries. So that's really nice. It used to be if you had zero manpower, you couldn't even hire merc templates, which was stupid. Now you can, which is good. Fix the autonomy effect on local land force limit from being additive to multiplicative. There was a huge bug that I reported multiple times about the force limit calculation being just completely wrong on like virtually every province. The only provinces that had correct force limit calculation were exactly 10 development provinces. So now it's fixed, um, which is good. So correct force limits are now calculated. No message was shown when the player became payable controller. <laughs> How does that happen? The game has been out for two and a half years and no one noticed up until now that there was no tooltip, no pop-up or anything for when you become the Papal Controller. Well, okay, now it's in the game. Cool. Allies with the same overlord now auto-join independence wars. Makes sense. So we should see the colonists, the colonies try to break free together. We should see allied, um, you know, vassals that are disloyal all work together a little bit better. Fixed a bug where the AI would rival you at 80 or more trust. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Fool me once, shame on you. No, fool me once, shame on me. Fool me twice, shame on you. Like... No, it's the other way around, isn't it? <laughs> anyway, Paradox, you keep saying this. I don't believe you. I believe the AI will still backstab. We'll see. Build two unit. Build units will now try to avoid enemies better on the way to the original unit. So, that's a, a fairly long video to cover the patch notes. I think we spent the most time, actually we spent half the time just talking about the expansion features, which is probably a good thing. You know, I like giving my opinion more so than just reading this, because if you wanted to read it, you could read it yourself. And I'll, I'll put a link in the description down below if you want to go check it out. But um, yeah, this this is a, a good patch. It'll be interesting. I'm um, really looking forward to continuing to play and uh, seeing, how, seeing how things play out. So hopefully this information was helpful to you. And I do look forward to seeing your comments down below. So let me know what your thoughts are. Do you guys like sailors? Do you like the espionage ideas? Do you think that they're out of whack? Do they need to be nerfed, buffed? I personally feel like they're cool, but all the numbers are wrong. Pretty much all the numbers are wrong. Corruption, the amount of corruption you gain from actually slandering, uh, like promoting corruption is just not enough. And it costs too many points. It takes too long. It, It's good, but it needs to be, it needs to be refined. And uh, we'll see. So let me know what your thoughts are. Maybe I'm wrong. I look forward to seeing you again in the next video. See you soon.